All right, guys, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Um, today's topic is persuasion, negotiating skills, and how to get others to say yes. We are excited to have um, Dr. Julie Turner, professor uh, over at Lindenwood University and Vision Class of 2019, to uh, join us today to serve as our host and leader for today's discussion. Um, again, and I, uh, it is wonderful just to be able to see so many of your faces. I, um, I feel like I'm living completely virtual right now via Facebook um, and trying to keep up with everybody and what everybody is going on now, what's going on in your lives. But uh, I'm so excited to be able to see uh, your faces today and uh, again, being able to interact. I've got a little bit of vision business to cover here uh, as we get started. Um, I want to make sure that, and if I can try and make sure that my PowerPoint actually goes through here. I get to mention our sponsors. Our main platinum sponsor this year is Barnes Jewish St. Peter's Hospital and Progress West Hospital. Um, they are our main pl uh, platinum sponsor and also our graduation um, uh, host and we'll be helping as soon as we get to graduation now, which feels like it will be forever away. They will serve as our host that evening and our main graduation sponsor. Our gold sponsor this year, we get to welcome a new company into our mix this year is Compass Health Network, specializing in mental health uh, assistance throughout our county. Kelly Kerr is on our board of directors and, and has been a tremendous supporter when he moved over to Compass, was uh, instrumental in getting them to, to jump over and serve as, um, as a main sponsor for us this year. Our silver sponsors this year are Mercy, Mercy Hospitals, SSM Health, St. Joseph Hospital, both out in St. Charles and Lake St. Louis, and St. Luke's Hospital. Um, you'll see a little bit of a trend there with our, our health care providers in our community. See a tremendous value of being able to um, support our organization, but also see a tremendous value in the leadership that uh, we've been able to help support in our community, and they've been great supporters. They provide us with dollars that help keep your tuition costs lower. And uh, I've said this a couple of times, but your tuition costs would actually be about double what it is now but without uh, their support and their financial support into the organization. I also wanna make sure that I mention our alumni sponsor, the O'Fallon Hoots baseball team. Um, they uh, joined us this year. They are our alumni sponsor and helps support and sponsor our alumni newsletter, which in what, almost two years now, I guess, you guys will actually start getting and hearing all of the exciting news about what's taking place across our alumni and the events and things that we help support uh, as an organization. So I think that is all of my business that I get to take care of. And so Julie, let me jump over here and give you hosting ability. Okay, awesome. Perfect, perfect. I can go ahead and pull up, I can pull this up and I'm assuming that, you guys, I'm gonna do share screen on my end then. Yeah, sweet, okay. So I'll do that, but I'm going to, um, so I'm so glad to see everybody. See, I always put like things in like, you know, air quotes, cause see is sort of the operative word here. So um, in terms of why I think um, this topic is so important, so my, own personal background is so I teach nonprofit administration at Lindenwood. I've been here for 13 years, which is phenomenal. Love what I do. So my context for anything related to persuasion is a little bit more on the fundraising side. So you know, ran nonprofit organizations was a development director. Um, I'm also a grant writer on the side, and so grant writing is all about you know how to figure out how you know what they're wanting and what we have and how to make that connection and, and selling. And so quite frankly, you know, negotiating can cover, can, uh, can cover anything from like hard, you know, hardcore negotiations and a contract to, you know, simply negotiating with people that you do every day business with or our children is probably a really good experience for us that we've had 
with negotiation. Um, and so we do a lot of this. And so what I wanted to do, and I, I, you know, I'm kind of an educator, so I gave you guys this handout book. And one of the things um, that that's really been effective for me, and I talk to my students a lot about this, is when it comes to being persuasive, if we even look at back at like what Aristotle used to do. And so, you know, he was famous for his ability to spin rhetoric, right? And so in his capacity, and that was a really long time ago, you know, there were three components of things that had to happen really pretty much for the most, time, most part simultaneously to get people to buy into what you're trying to influence. And so getting back to the Latin thing, we got pathos, logos, and ethos, okay? So pathos is, is the ability, um, you know, to appeal to someone's self-interest, kind of the more their emotional level. Um, then we have logos, which is more, you know, appealing to like the logical, practical reasoning side of things. And then, you know, lastly, ethos, the ethics. So the, the right or wrong or else, you know, looking at from, from this perspective is how credible is the person who's talking to you? You know, if you respect that individual, then you're maybe going to be more inclined to want to buy what they're selling. So what I wanted to do for fun, and I've done this, um, with uh, my students before and it's and it has a purpose i promise and i know that two people said they are willing to go so what i ask you guys to do is if you could pick a color and then you're going to sell it and i'm going to let you decide what that means to you what does selling mean to you and then what i we would do is when so i don't know if angie wants to go first somebody else had their color too but when when our when your classmate is selling their color um just kind of jot down we're gonna do this twice, but I have this little, little work, worksheet here. Anything that he or she says that has to do with any of these things, is there anything that he or she says that connects to the emotive um, aspect? Anything that speaks to the logical, more practical reasoning side of, of whatever the color would be? And then lastly, is there anything that your, your seller does to establish their credibility on, on the matter? So. Angie, you feel like going first? You feeling it? Sure. All right, girl, you got the floor. All right, this color is for ambitious people who appreciate luxury. Armed with this knowledge, doesn't it make sense that this is the only color for you? It's such an important color that the sails on Cleopatra's ships were dyed purple. Let's do the right thing and make sure you are well represented and make this purchase. Awesome. Okay, do you guys need her to do it again or do you feel like you jotted down enough ideas to go through some of the ways that she used each of these pieces? What's the thought of the crew? Do it again, Angie, if you would. Yeah, do it one more time. You got it. This color is for ambitious people who appreciate luxury. Armed with this knowledge, doesn't it make sense that this is the only color for you? It's such an important color that the sails on Cleopatra's ships were dyed purple. Let's do the right thing to make sure you are well represented and make this pur purchase. Okay, great. So I have a couple of notes here. So what did she, what in her pitch um did she say that did anything to kind of connect to the emotional aspect to get you to feel or sense something mentioned ambition and luxury right and who doesn't want that right okay i love how she said the only color for you you know using you is a really powerful way of connecting with people and personalizing something um, how about anything relating to sort of the logical or reasoning aspect of, of the color that she had? Mention knowledge. I heard yep. knowledge. Good. Doesn't it make sense? Yes. And asking questions in, in sales or influential pieces is very effective, um, especially if the person is not in a position where they're only saying yes or no answers. That's actually a very effective means of negotiation. And then anything about um, that sort of position her in a position of credibility or that maybe position the color to have credibility. 
Cleopatra. Yeah, totally. She also appealed to do the right thing, which goes to trust and morality. Okay, good. You guys have some good things. See, Angie, you got all kinds of things packed into that 15 seconds or 20 seconds that you did. So was purple the color? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Is that your favorite color? It is my favorite color. It's my favorite too. I like it. It just happens to be that my my presentation has purple in it. But okay, yeah. so that's cool. So so even if you so Angie, you probably didn't even know in advance that's that what that's what we've been looking for. But let me let me ask you before we go to your classmates or other color. When you were told to do this, this is kind of weird because you don't just go and sell a color. That was the whole point of it, because it's sort of an abstract right. thought. What what were you trying to come up with in your mind to make this a sellable thing to your classmates. Well, I did look at your first page on the packet that Mark sent. Okay. Um, so I did try to co combine the the um, the pathos, legos, uh, logos, and ethos. And so, and also, I'm cheating a little bit, I guess, because I'm taking um, language of sales. So I'm a lot oh, of the, cool. which is an NLP uh, based training. So. Um, I employed a little bit like the tie downs, you know, like, let's do the right thing. Um, you know, that's, I use some things that I've learned. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Looks like it's working out well for you. Thank you so much. So, yay, Angie, that's fantastic. Okay. I don't know who, someone else said they had a color ready. So who is it? And, um, and tell us who you are. And, and if you're ready to go, then we're ready to, ready to see you. Okay, it was me, Mindy Pruitt. Hi, Mindy. Um, and so with mine is pink is a positive color, inspiring warmth, comforting thoughts, and is associated with hope. While there are many shades to choose from, ranging from soft to brilliant, the color is uh, helpful in alleviating anger and aggression with its calming, reassuring emotional, uh, emotional energy. Pink represents love of yourself and others, affection, friendship, harmony, inner peace and approachability it is intuitive insightful and all around and an all-around happy color and combined with dark colors such as navy or black creates sophistication charities choose to use pink in their marketing to create feelings of compassion warmth sentimental bonds and understanding so think pink that was adorable awesome do you guys need her to do it again or did you were you able to felt like you were able to get enough notes taken down? One more time. All right, Mindy. Okay. Pink is a positive color inspiring warm, comforting thoughts and is associated with hope. While there are many shades to choose from, ranging from soft to brilliant, the color is helpful in alleviating anger and aggression with its calming, reassuring emotional energy. Pink represents love of yourself and others, affection, friendship, harmony, inner peace, and approachability. It is intuitive, insightful, and an all-around happy color that when combined with dark colors such as black or navy creates sophistication. Charities choose to use pink in their marketing to create feelings of compassion, warmth, sentimental bonds, and understanding. So think pink. Okay. All right, so we, she has a, a couple of categories that were especially strong. So how about from, from, the, from the pathos, from the, like what kind of emotive language did she use? So warmth, mm -hmm. comfort, hope, and then also the, just the charitable um, giving at the end as well. Yeah, so she created a sensation. Like I was sitting there just feeling all the things that she was, that she was talking about. How, how anything else I had hope, Happy, of course, reassuring, affection. Positive, inspiring, calming. Right. So she was definitely really, especially strong, um, you know, in that emotive language for sure. Was there anything that, that she presented that helped with the logic reasoning aspect? Comfort thoughts, intuitive. When she talked about alleviating anger and aggression, so that's another that shows knowledge. It's, it's a, right. gives another reason, right? Like related to something else. I, I like how she used the phrase "choose from," so that gives like the that gives a listener power. You know, you can 
you have options you can choose from this. Um, and then how about, um, so logic and reasoning, um, credible, I mean, I, I felt like because she gave so many examples from many, some, from such a wide range of things, I felt like that established credibility for her. Well, did you guys have any other, any other thoughts about that? I, I would agree. And then at the end, when she talked about like, when you pair it with different colors, it, you know, it's, it says sophistication. So that just that word right there adds credibility. Yeah, I would agree. I love how she said um, it complements others. So the nice thing about that is that it's, that also sort of applies to our reasoning logic because it's not like she's just trying to sell pink. It's that, hey, pink also is a very complementary to other things. So that was great. So you guys are fabulous. You should go out and sell colors anytime. I know there's <laughs> such a market for that, of course. Awesome. Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, I'm going to move some of this so I can see my stuff here. So when you look at what the term negotiate means, so I'm going to be talking about a few different terms a little bit interchangeably. Um, and, and I think what we think of selling or negotiating, we think we sometimes think of those as being very hard skills, like they're manipulative, that we're going to intend to exploit people. But if you think if you think about it, the, the crux of it or the core of it really comes down to influence. And anything that you will learn or have already learned about with respect to, to leadership is that influence is really a huge part of that, whether you choose to positively influence or negatively influence others, but that's, that's a, such an essential part of it. Um, especially in today's organizations where we're becoming less, much less hierarchical and less dependent on individual heroes, in our country, the cool thing uh, is that, you know, that we all have different opportunities in which that we can become influential and in persuading others, even if we don't necessarily have a title um, that goes along with that. So a, a few things that are important just to help differentiate in our mind is, you know, we talk about persuasion. Okay, so that what persuasion at its core means is the ability to convince others to take appropriate action. Okay, and that's, and we know this every day in our life, but that's essentially what is, you know, persuasion is to convince others to take appropriate action. Okay, then if we're looking at the term negotiate, um, this is a little bit, a little bit different level of sophistication with this. This is when we're able to discuss and reach a mutually satisfactory agreement. Okay, so in order for us to be able to negotiate, and some of you guys do this in your occupations right now, we, we have to have that ability to listen to the needs of others, to figure out what matters to them and figuring out that good soft place where we're gonna be able to find mutual understanding. Um, and then obviously finding an agreement acceptable to both sides. And so if you look at the term influence and if you were to have it as an overarching theme, influence is sort of the key concept and then persuasion and negotiation are subcategories um, of that. All right, so there's that. We did the colors for sale. We talked a little bit about this. I love this. Um, I think I learned this in high school and actually it's such a, a great way of looking at um, influence and persuasion. So if we want to look at what, what the so what, so what do you end up gaining from your ability to influence others? And there are three key outcomes, okay? It's commitment, compliance or so or resistance and so these are the three things that will potentially uh, be a byproduct of what you're doing okay so to give you a little bit of explanation around that so you know leaders with developed influencing skills achieve their goals more effectively all right influencing then results in commitment that's what you're wanting to see happen which means voluntary support you know there's this adage of getting other people to do what you want because it's what they want to. So when you get to that point where, there, where you're developing commitment, that's gonna have a much more long-term sustainable, sustainable aspect of influence, all right? So uh, the cool thing about that is that once you gain commitment from folks, you have a lower need for monitoring, a higher sustained effort over time, a better focus on a shared goal, and improved interpersonal um, relations. So that's a very strong byproduct or outcome for influence. Okay, now conversely, or a little bit shifting away from that, 
Um, if, if influencing by the leader is less effect, effective, then people become compliant, right? So, and we deal this in, in, you know, if I were to ask you, you know, how do you feel about your job or how do you feel about your boss? And if we were having sort of just a confidential conversation, you know, you know what, what this feels like, because you'll say things like, you know, I really respect his or her position. I don't really care so much for that person, but I respect the fact that they're in a position of authority. Okay, if you've ever said something like that, and I know I have totally said that um, about people in my life, then what's really happening is that we're, we're coming to a place of compliance, okay? We're not at commitment necessarily, we're at a place of compliance. And so what happens with that is their attitude and mindset do not change. So you feel the same way about someone. Um, and so consent can lead to higher productivity, but does not unleash the full potential of engagement nor the creativity of a talent. So if we were to tier these things, as I have up here on the screen, commitment is the ultimate best goal to get. Compliance would be the next best thing, still not great. Then lastly, we of course have um, resistance. And so if the influencing is not effective, the result is, is, is resistance. And this, these are two, two things that happen here. Uh, you're either gonna obstruct or you're gonna sabotage, okay? so. You, uh, by overruling the leader, by attempting to persuade the leader to renounce his or her idea, by looking for excuses or pretending to comply. So influence, ultimately, these are the three things that are going to happen as a consequence um, of, of influence. And so, you know, you have to look at what your ultimate goal is. Um, what I'm going to move into now, and I'm going to cover everything, and then because I have the screen completely filled in, um, I don't, I'm not seeing your comments right now, but I'll take a little break in just a minute um, to, to ask some questions or just to give some feedback. So I have this aspect here, this heart, head, and, um, heart, head, and mind thing. And, and very, this is very similar to what I was talking about earlier when we look at the, the, the art of rhetoric, the pathos, logos, and ethos. So if you are trying to sell something or influence something, um, these three things need to be happened to, to get the best possible outcomes. You really need all three of these things. So you need the head in order to, to do that. You have to deliver data and information to help substantiate some more of the quantitative aspect. There has to be the heart aspect. So the power of the relationship, the relationship that you have with another person. When I look back and you talk about fundraising, and I don't know if I, we have any folks in here that field, but they will, you know, we, we talk about over and over again that you have to have a relationship with that donor to gain that trust for them to see the credibility um, that you have. And then, of course, the last piece is the, uh, is the hand, meaning the power of expertise or the credibility. So those are the three parts that have to happen. And what I'm going to show you guys up here, and then I'm going to be able to do this where I can see you guys. So if I were to give this the example of a fundraising um, appeal, and again, this could be very transferable to sales, but I'm gonna give you guys just a second. These are two different versions of a fundraising appeal. Okay, so I'm gonna give you guys just a minute to look at both of these, and then I'm gonna ask um, for, some, for some takeaways. So go ahead and give a minute. Okay, so when you take a first read at either of these things, what do you see as being the, like what's the upside of version one? Like when you read this, and if you were to get this in the mail, how do you feel like this first appeal is effective? It's, personally fact. feel it's very factual. Okay, very factual. Brad, you're gonna say something? Yeah, I just said it, it's, it states facts. Okay. It states facts, but when I see 3 million children, that also hits me emotionally. It does, okay. Awesome, okay, so there's, there's one aspect of the appeal. How do you feel about the second one? 
It is definitely heart driven. It is definitely tugs at your strings. You're, it's more about one person. Okay. All right. Really good. So let me ask you guys, if you were to receive either of these, so not, not together, but separately, which one of these things could potentially move you to want to make a donation to whatever this charity is? What do you think, Brad? Number two? Yeah, I think number two. Okay. Mm -hmm. For me, it's number one. And, and simply because version two, we see that that's a sim, that's a kind of, we see those ads on TV all the time, but it's yeah. very similar. And so it because and it's almost, um, when you see something repeatedly, you start to be, get a little bit desensitized to it. So I've seen this ad so many times in different yes. versions. That's where, that's, so for me, version one is much more, and that's just personal, more impactful. Yeah, absolutely. So, so before we move on to, to the data of what worked or didn't work, so we, we um, in, and I, again, I know that you're not all nonprofit people and I'm not going to continue to use these kinds of examples, but we call that kind of compassion voyeurism, Angie, what you're talking about. So, you know, charitable organizations have to be really careful to, to make sure that you're providing a painting of the urgency of the matter, absolutely. And for us, you know, in first world countries, we can't begin to appreciate the plight that some are going through. But to your point, sometimes if it's, if it's too overwhelming, if you see the need, you, you are, it renders you paralyzed from wanting to do anything at all because you're so overwhelmed and you think there's nothing that I can do. All I can give is $25. So that's not going to help anything with this plight. So that's a great observation. So let's, um, the, the, this appeal and this is study, and here's, here's how this worked out. So those who read the stats, so gave the, the version number one, they gave on average of $1.14. All right. So those who read only the story, the second one about Rokia, when they read the story, they gave $2.38. All right. So interestingly, when it comes to this kind, so charitable giving runs a little bit differently. When it comes to our hearts, what the, the message here is that one individual trumps the masses, generally speaking, okay? And so you think, well, shoot, you know, what if we did both? But we have the drop in the bucket effect. If people feel overwhelmed by the scale of the problem, and they think, they're, as I mentioned just and they talked about the compassion warriors and thing aspect too, they don't feel like their, their donation is going to make much of a difference, and so they're just not going to do it at all, okay? So that's not. Now, interestingly, you would think that if you had both, letters. Um, very sadly, in this particular case, if they got both letters, they only gave $1.43. So they didn't necessarily give tons and tons um, more. So there was, there was that aspect. Um, but the important thing here is that you have to have ultimately all three of these things. And this is happening in sales or anything else. You have to be able to, um, the first aspect I have here is understanding and navigating the organizational Politics. So depending on what it is that you're trying to influence in your organization and you know, we just have to understand that organizations have formal and informal structures. Okay, understanding and effectively navigating through complex or political situations require political insight. And when I'm saying political here, I'm not necessarily meaning like legislative partisan politics. Every organization, I work for Lindenwood, we have, we have a culture here that's different than probably the cultures that you guys work with. And you have to be very intuitive and mindful. And, you know, when you, when you come into a new, um, a new job, just trying to get a feel for the vibe of things, you know, how things work first, because you might come in with all kinds of really good ideas to influence something, but if you don't have respect for how things work, the politics, the culture, the climate, you're gonna have a very difficult time um, making any progress with anything. So understanding what to be sensitive to. The second thing here is creating visibility. Um, so how leaders stand out um, is, being, is being getting noticed. Now the trick here is finding the balance between being getting noticed, but also being authentic. Because we also know people that are getting noticed, but their motivations are not for the right reasons. They're, showboating, they're trying to get credit for things. That's not, that's not what I'm um, referencing at all. But you um, being, being noticed also are things, I know I have huge respect for people who make sure that other people get credit, okay? So they are very much careful to allow 
um, team members to shine without over promoting themselves. So finding that balance. So creating visibility doesn't mean just for you and what you have to contribute, but also making sure that you're an advocate or, or a, uh, a strong ambassador for the people that work with you. Okay. The next thing that has to happen in order to make all three of these things work together when you're approaching something to be persuasive is maintaining and building personal trustworthiness. And I know this is really um, an important fa factor for me too. So leaders ask others to take risks along with them. So they have to be able to believe in the leader and his or her leadership. And so how we need to do that in the capacity is making sure that we exercise and demonstrate in integrity and being trusted. One really strong way of doing that is never asking other people to do stuff that you're not willing to do yourself. And I know I had like that is probably for me for a supervisor or somebody who's has some kind of authority over me. That is probably my, one of my number one values and what I have for other people is that you're not going to be able to get people to, to influence other people if you have not gained some kind of a means of integrity and being trustworthy. Um, otherwise, what we get back to, remember we talked about the difference between commitment and um, compliance, right? And so, you know, a parenting is a great example of this. Sometimes we're <laughs> definitely doing that with our kids. So the third, uh, I'm sorry, the fourth thing rather here, you know, is leveraging networks, okay? So forming, and this is a cool thing about vision, uh, whether we're in sort of the, this phase that we're in or next year when you guys are actually in person with each other. So forming and nurturing a network of, of relationships is super invaluable um, in our interconnected world. You know, it allows us to generate new experiences and to tap into the skills and vision of others. And I would probably, uh, you might agree that networking now during, now we're seeing what happens, right? So when we have a pandemic and we have much fewer um, means by which we can connect with each other, I know I feel the cost. Like I feel like there's an associated consequence to that. And that's not feeling as connected to others. And so, you know, one of the, I think one of the cool things that has come as a result of this pandemic is to realize that we really need each other. We need relationships and that technology only has, only has so much capacity for doing that, of course. All right, moving on here, clear communication. Um, writing and speaking clearly, briefly, applying a variety of communication styles to help leaders get the message across and ensure the right impact. Um, you know, I know I've, I, if I'm in communication with folks and, you know, when we're talking about things and they will say, you know, things aren't getting communicated very clearly, not very well, and you're going to, you're going to lack faith or trust in that type of a, of a situation if you don't feel like you have an ability to communicate very well or to, or, or to hear what's being communicated. And then the last piece here I would have around the same piece is this motivating others. Okay, so how leaders do this is they figure out the needs and the styles and the motivators of others and so that takes time to figure out what is what matters and what's meaningful to other people and so people will like to work with and for these leaders and will be more receptive to their influencing if they feel like they have a good understanding of what their motivational uh, needs would be you guys have any comments or questions about this how or you know is this making sense to you do you have any any feedback? I liked what you talked about uh, motivating others. We had a business planning clinic today and, uh, and we had one of our, our top, uh, well, a few of our top people kind of delivering some great content. And one of the things that, um, that Tom Bosler talked about was, uh, you know, part of motivating others is to make sure that there's opportunity for them to grow. So when you look at mm -hmm. like their org chart has a bunch of gray spots in it. And those gray spots are positions that haven't been filled yet. yet. So when they're bringing on talent, that talent can see there's opportunity. So that's a motivator right there. So just making sure that you're not putting um, a limit on someone else's growth. For me, yeah. in my opinion, that's a terrible thing to do to somebody. Um, so I think that just right there, just your culture becomes a motivator. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's a real, yeah, that's a very, it's a really good piece of insight. Does anyone else have any other thoughts about, about any of these pieces, head, heart, hand? Yeah, so I have a question. Um, so yeah. I was reading the, you know, the two scenarios. And right. when I looked at the two scenarios and then I looked at what I wrote for my color persuasion yeah. speech, 
I noticed that I was drawn more to the factual information. Interesting. Um, and I also wrote my appeal very factual. So how do you, you know, maybe, I don't, I don't know if it's a balance of making sure that you're doing the language that you speak, but also making sure that you're including the languages that other people speak. Yeah. How do you well, find that a, proper balance? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and it's funny that you say that because I really felt like your appeal, I mean, it, it, it created a sensory experience for me, you know, and that's actually much more emotive. So I, I would say based on what you're, what you're saying is finding, so if, if you find that you're more of a data driven person, is that what you're saying? Is that pretty, like that's working for you? Well, you need that too. But then what I would do, um, if you've got a couple of friends or colleagues who are a little bit more leaning the other way, you know, just throwing ideas past them to see what works. I, I do that a lot. I have, you know, in my own, um, you know, my own career, I work with, with college students, of course, every day. Now, I'm also the parent of two college kids. This is a very expensive time in my life, you might want to say. And I also have a high school senior. So there's a ton of times where I'll have an idea about something and I'll run it past my kids. And, you know, they, they're pretty uh, direct with me. <laughs> like sometimes painfully so. But I would, I would run things past them. If you think about it, that's why companies do focus groups and, you know, they, they will observe things. But if you feel like you operate one way and it's not maybe resonating, you maybe could get people, a couple of people that, again, swing a little bit more further the other way and just practice an appeal to get some language or concepts that you might uh, translate to, to more of a universal audience. Does that make sense? Yeah. So is there a magical question that you can ask at the beginning of a conversation that you're having with someone to be able to identify how to speak better to them, whether it's more the statistic driven or the emotional driven? Oh, that's great. So, um, okay. So my experiences are more around uh, with fundraising things. Let me see if I can, if anyone else has chimes in. So sometimes you can find safe ways to start a conversation just doing observation of space so um you know like if you're meeting somebody at a coffee shop i always like to get there a little early and just start getting a, a feel for the vibe of the place and then that way um you can start coming up with conversation starters right you know you can say so if you go to go to mark and melissa's place which you totally should go to by the way i'm trying to influence you um you know, you you could say things. Oh my gosh, you know, have you have you ever been here before? And 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 find starting out just conversationally with people to figure out what matters to them and what resonates with people is always a great way. And also, it just develops a sense of trust um, first. And it could be, and and you know, Shelly, I'm not sure what you uh, what you are trying to sell or persuade, but sometimes your very first conversation with somebody is all about building rapport, relationship, and trust, has nothing to do with asking for anything. Oh, for sure. Right away, right? And again, my, again, my professional context is more um, fundraising. We, you know, as when, we, when I used to do calls on folks to, to raise funding, the first visit was never about the ask. It was always about, because, you know, there's otherwise people are very, reticent and feel used and that's not the point i mean when you're asking for donations for instance it's it's creating a means by which they can invest in in your mission that matters to them and i'm going to assume that sales in you know in more of the for-profit world works very similarly so sometimes it's just that you're just going to have to you know these things take being able to influence people is not an over it's not an overnight thing not in the most meaningful way anyway. I mean, sometimes if there's a crisis, you have to, you have to say, we're, we're doing this now. And you're getting compliance because you have to. You're in a crisis and you don't have space to do, to do anything else. But that's my two cents. Does anyone else have another thought for that? Angie, what do you think? Yeah, so, so with us, part, one of the things we get trained on is mirroring, mirroring and matching. So if I'm going to uh, meet with a, a potential you know, buyer or seller, I'm spending, I'm asking questions and spending a lot more time listening and they're going to tell you, you know, 
how they want to be communicated to. So if I'm sitting with an engineer, we're not going to have a lot of fluffy talk. I'm going to get, I'm going to be like you. I'm going to get right to the data. He wants facts and figures, and that's what I'm going to come armed with. He's not, we're not going to talk a lot about kids because that's not what they're going to want. Um, and that's a very clear example. I mean, tell me you're an engineer, that's where you're going to go. So what they'll let you know. So that's the whole, so you just try to mirror and match the conversation that they're, that they want to have. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. can tell the, go ahead. The body language is there. They're looking at their watch and like, so, you know, you know, then you, you have an obligation. You might have a whole rhetoric that you've developed, but you have an obligation to move things ahead and get to the point. Somebody else was trying to say something. Sorry, yeah, Dave. Yeah, it's Dave. Um, just the thing on the previous slide, we talked about motivating others, trying to understand and get to know how they're motivated. Shelly, it's great introspection on your part to know that you're thinking data driven and all that. One of the things in communicating you can look for as far as a magic question, it's not necessarily a question, but it's how they respond. A lot of people will say, I think about this, I think this is the case, or other people will say, I feel. And right there, you'll know whether people are you know, the version one data driven, I think, or they're, I feel, um, and they're more emotionally driven. And that's a way to understand it. And like you said, if, uh, if you understand that about yourself, be guarded against that and realize that your audience that you may be speaking to may be drawn from a different perspective. And one of it is just to ask, who, who is it that I'm speaking to and how are they motivated? And take that into consideration as you're going to present. And the last comment I have is this appeals with the logos, pathos, and ethos. It also goes to the profit world of sales, which is people won't purchase from you unless they know, like, and trust you. Absolutely. No, like is the emotional appeal, and then the trust is the morality piece. Yeah, and, and you know, this doesn't seem like rocket science, but if you feel, you know, if you almost assume that we, we almost all have the orientation of what do you want from me, right? That's a protective measure that we all have, and so, you know, making sure that we're, of course, putting, you know, the value of the relationship and the value of trust um, first. You guys have some great insight here. What I want to move ahead with is um, the, the role of empathy. And not only is empathy just a great quality for us to have as just decent human beings, but it's, it's a very, very critical piece for us to have in, or, in order for us to be influential leaders too. And I wanted to read this little um, clip that has to do with this very first picture I have on here. So in Stephen Covey's book, a lot of you guys have maybe have read Seven Habits of Most Effective um, Efficient People. Um, here was one of experience that, that uh, Stephen Covey had on a subway ride. And I, I love this story, so I'll read it to you. So some kids were jumping around in the same car that he was as they were really bothering him. So this, I'm just paraphrasing. He was talking about this in quite some depth. He went over to the children's father and asked if he could please control his boys. I'm sure that went over very well. Um, the, boy, the father responded saying that this was, that he did not notice his boys were bothering anyone. And then Stephen thought that was kind of strange because they were bothering everybody. The boys were clearly out of control. He asked the father, could you pos how could you possibly have not noticed this? Uh, the father explained that he was extremely sorry. He simply did not notice. He continued to explain that he had just left the hospital where he and his boys got word that their mother, his wife, had died. The father said that none of them had any idea how to act in this situation. So that's kind of a gut punch, right? And that took a lot of courage for someone as respected as Stephen Covey to admit that he was pretty insensitive on the subway. But what I love about that, and I know for me personally, I had a lot of good modeling of this in my life. My dad is probably one of the most empathetic um, people I know, but I love this role of empathy. And, you know, we've seen the, we've seen the things, the, the sayings about, you know, be kind, you never know, um, you know, what anyone else is going through. I'm doing, I'm doing a terrible job paraphrasing that, that saying, but that's really important. Empathy needs to be done and not in a coercive um, way. The ability to step into the shoes or experiences of someone else, to not always presume the worst in someone, and 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 I think right now I've I've noticed, um, you know, we're we're all we're all tired. We're tired of wearing masks. We're tired of being told we can't do things, and so we're get, maybe I'm the only one who's getting crabby. So I'll just take the, the ownership of that. But understanding what's the thing behind the thing, and and probably an example that I can think of um, about an hour or so ago, one of my college um, kids had called me, and she was a little upset. She's 
she's in her final interview for this internship that she wants really badly. Um, she interviews really well. I know I've, I've listened to her before. And anyway, the, the interviewer was super blunt and direct and crabby, and it was done over Skype or Zoom or something like that. And I told her, Megan, and you know, my kids just know that this is how, what kind of response they're going to get from me. I'm like, listen, you don't, you have no idea what happened in her world today, right? You don't know if she, if she had an argument with her, with her spouse, if she, if her car broke down, you know, what's the thing behind the thing? And so it's so important to understand and to be empathetic to what's happening with other people and to be mindful and to look into that and to not always presume uh, the worst in other people. And kind of a fun idea, and I have these little, I don't know if any of you guys have seen these optical illusions I have up here, but this reminds me a lot of empathy that things are not exactly always the way they appear. And maybe you guys, you, you guys have seen these before, um, I know whenever I see optical illusions, I always see the abstract thing, which I think is, does, I don't know what that's telling me about myself, but this very first one, what do you guys see when you see this one? The black and white one. I guess they're almost all black and white. Liar. Person. You Face. saw a person? Liar. Yeah. So, and again, that's what's fun about optical illusions is the whole point of that is to understand that there's more to it than what it seems. How about the second one? It should be color on your screen. What do you, what's the first thing that you see? A young woman. Okay. I see an old woman. Yeah. yeah. Old woman. There's both in there. Do you see them now when you shift your perspective a little bit? I can see both in the first two. Good. But yeah, okay. I always notice the face or the young one first. Yeah. I yeah, no matter how many times you've seen it, huh? Okay, this last one is kind of a mind bend. So it says, how many legs does the elephant have? And I, man, tr just, tr I know, just try this one. This is a complete head, head messes with your head big time. Looks like five, but you, elephants don't have five legs. <laughs> I see eight. You notice that when you stare at a couple of them, then your, my, your eyes go this way? You're all like, it's too late in the day to be messing with this kind of stuff. Yes. So anyway, I just was trying to provide a, a fun spin that when you're influencing other people, now it does, what I'm not suggesting is that you go to someone's weakness. And if they're going through a hard time, but you gain trust from others when you're empathetic, okay? Um, and I'll, I'll give you um, kind of a positive example. I wanna say a very positive um, attribute of my employer. So as, as I mentioned before, I've been at Linwood for 13 years. Um, and what I have always greatly appreciated about my employer is their ability to respect and honor my, my work-life balance needs. And so, you know, when I first started working here, my kids were really young and my husband was traveling a lot. And what was probably as important or not more important to me was the availability, the ability to be flexible so that I wouldn't miss stuff, right? There's only... The, any of us as parents know you get one shot at going through all these things. I didn't want to miss games. I didn't want to miss parent-teacher conferences. I wanted to be the room parent. I wanted to be very involved. And my employer has always been awesome with that. So um, I've never felt challenged with that. So for me, I want to work that much harder because I feel like they have given me a gift that, that I know that I probably couldn't get from some other employers. And that's a gift of being flexible and respecting that. And so what they've, I feel like they've gotten from me is, a, is an even more productive, hopefully, we'll see, more productive employee because I trust my in work environment. I know they have my best interest. They're not micromanaging me. And so that has, I mean, I love it here. And that's a huge reason why. Okay, so there's that. So here's the example I thought it would be fun for us to run through. Okay, so... I was trying to think of an example of influence and I thought almost everyone, unless you work for yourself, although you could try to maybe go ahead and ask yourself for a raise, that might actually be fun if you could do that. I thought I would go through the, an example of asking for a raise. So have any of you been in, in the situation before? I'm gonna go through some of the tips and then I would love to hear some um, things that you guys have tried. Who, how about you just raise your hand? Anyone asked for a raise before? I know I have. No, not yet. I'm trying to see everybody here. Okay, all right. Let me let me talk through this. 
So um, here's a great example. And then again, we can share some ideas after this. Um, interestingly, so looking at some data here, so 39% asked for a raise during their last review cycle. Those who did, 85% of them got it. Okay, so not asking for it, is has huge consequences. Let me say that one more time. 30% asked for a raise during their last review cycle. This is a survey done just this past fiscal year. Those who did, 85% of those people got an increase. So again, not, not asking doesn't have any real payoffs, okay? So the next tip I have here too is establish a value before you set a price tag. Okay, so, um, you know, I'll talk to students about this. There's like trying to figure out what they're going to ask for for a salary or whatever else. And it's never because, hey, I've been here a long time or it's never about your outside circumstances. It's like, listen, we've got more medical bills. Those things aren't really going to be ter too terribly convincing. It's not uh, needs to be based on an actual contribution that you've made to the organization, not because you need more money. Okay, it's because it's a merit based opportunity you have actually been producing more and so there's a, a quantitative value to that that you deserve it not that you need it okay so what you would do is you would sit down and make a list of value added above and beyond contributions to the organization so if you're getting paid for doing this and you're doing this then it probably is going to be really hard to to lobby for getting this but if you keep making a list of things that add value actual you know financial qualitative or quantitative value to an organization above and beyond what your salary is offering is what you should start taking a list of okay so in for instance if you have any examples of how you have boosted sales how you save the company money savings is a is a quantifiable thing too you know how did you decrease hassle how did you make things less uh more efficient streamlining you know, how you show leadership under pressure, all those things ultimately have a, uh, a consequence or an outcome that if it ends up um, making your organization better as a result of that, you should, you should put it on a list that you can figure out a way to quantify that. All right, so the next tip I have here, if you're in a situation, you're gonna talk about your future of the organization and the role you'll play in it. Okay, so for, for instance, um, and if you're going to put this in quantifiable terms, a new hire on average in the US, a new hire costs about $4,000 in recruiting costs for a mid-range position. So if you were to leave, okay, so it's still cheaper to potentially consider advocating for you to get a raise than to go find somebody else to do it cheaper, okay? So it's on average about $4,000 in recruiting costs, and that's just for a mid-range position. And also on average um, in the US, uh, the average time of replacement is about seven months. So that's seven, so by the time you leave that you give your two weeks notice, they're having to ramp up and, and recruit and, and hire and advertise or whatever else. That's seven months lost, okay, of productivity, of sales or anything else. So, if you, you know, if we're, I think we're often very fearful, and I've seen this with my own kids too, with their, you know, their little hour, their hourly wage jobs, we, we assume that people are going to let us go. But if you come at it from a different perspective in terms of how can I quantify or put a price tag along with the added value that I'm contributing to my organization, because losing you, unless you're doing something that actually increases costs or increases hassle, you know, uh, having you go is going to be much more costly. Okay, so what you should do when talking about the future, you want to be us centered. So it's not about you. It's not like I've worked so hard or I do so much. Or if you look at the future of the organization and how you want to guarantee the opportunity to be involved. So if I'm working for, for Jan and her, and, her, and her husband for Fast Signs, if I talk about a future and I say, listen, I see us moving this direction. Um, and I think I will be able to do these things and in investing in your future. Um, that's going to be much more successful, persuasive language, um, you know, for your supervisor, whoever you're also trying to influence around that. Um, and don't compare yourself to others. You're going to focus on your own merit. So it's not about, you know, I hear a lot of people talk about, well, they, they've heard what other people make. They've heard about what their peers are making. Okay, well, that can be a pretty big motivator. 
but you're not going to go in saying, hey, I just learned that these people are making X. Is that, you know, here, here is what I'm quantifying my contribution. I want to be a big part of your future. And, and, and here are the skills that I can bring forward to help us be even more successful moving forward. Um, okay, the next suggestion I have, this was true for me, for me personally coming to this job, um, is, you know, what are other, are there other non-salary benefits? So maybe it's not so much that you're looking for more pay, but you're looking for other aspects of flexibility. I think one of the, the good outcomes of this pandemic is I think more employers are going to become much more receptive to working from home. Right. So we had some kind of old school mentalities before this time where people was like, no, if you're not in the office, you surely can't be doing anything that's very helpful or meaningful. But I think now that people, excuse me, have had to work from home and are seeing hopefully productivity not being compromised, um, they're going to be that way. So if it's a case where, <clears throat> you know, your organization just financially is not in a good position, could you potentially barter for non-salary terms? And what I mean by that is more flex time, you know, more vacation, more, uh, a different title, a pr more prestigious title, uh, the ability to attend a conference to get better at learning a skill. So maybe have in your, in your bank other ideas. And so for, so for me, as I said, coming here, I know when I received my offer, um, you know, there's a lot of fixation on salary. I said, listen, that, that's really helpful, but here's what's really important to me. And I mentioned to you guys before, you know, I, you know, my husband's traveling a lot. Um, I have young kids. Could, could I have some assurances that I would have a schedule that would be within these parameters? And, and they did, and that worked. And for me, that was probably as much or more meaningful than anything else. Okay, the next tip I have, if you're looking for a raise, is to make sure that you time the pitch right. Um, and so a lot of people wait till their annual performance review to, to do this. Um, so you want to, the timing, the soft or the sweet spot of finding the right time to ask for a raise is when you've done really well on a project or taken on some other responsibility. So when you've had a big win and you know that you want to talk to your boss about it anyway, you, you are already in the good graces. So that's a really good time to potentially talk to them about your interest in, um, you know, maybe uh, receiving more compensation. This is going to be much easier to make your um, much easier to make your case sellable because you already he or she already has a pretty positive feeling about you. Um, and then you know you don't want to let them forget what an asset you are. I said asset just so we're clear how we said that. Yes. So right after some really huge boon or success, a really good time for you to start moving your way in for talking about. Hey, I'm really interested in talking about. Uh, you know, the future and how I fit into the future. Um, here's what I feel like I've been able to contribute um, that I feel are above and beyond what I'm doing. And, you know, would love to talk about the opportunity to be, you know, paid a little bit more commensurate with these extra things. Uh, another thing you should do if you're looking for a raise is to broach the topic very professionally. You're going to set up the meeting. You're not going to catch them in the hallway when they're trying to run home or whatever else. You're going to set up an actual time uh, and like two parties trying to reach a compromise, you're going to come up with your, you're going to have developed your list of accomplishments neatly typed for them to reference and you can share it. You know, I'll, I'd have a copy, the, your boss would have a copy. And then you want to have your salary request printed at the top is, is a really good thing to do so that we're not, because what's going to happen is you might get into that situation, you might start to backpedal because you feel insecure or you are starting to doubt yourself, but you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have that committed in writing and, 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 and spend a little time taking some math with it. Um, and what else do I wanna say about that? This shouldn't be the first time you uh, review your accomplishments. Um, then you know, ask how you know if you are successful and higher than report back routinely. So making sure that you are already having pretty routine ongoing um, check-ins, okay? Just a couple more thoughts, and then I want to get some of your guys' thoughts about how you've been able to exercise persuasion in your workplaces. Um, you're not going to want to be a jerk about this. And this seems really silly, but you're not going to want to be condescending. Um, if they start, you know, rolling their eyes or whatever else, um, you're not going to want to say things like, you know what, if you're not able to evaluate my ability to get uh, and raise right now, I'm going to walk, okay? Those things actually, I mean, those are only good in movies. They, act, they don't really work in real life. Um, and if, 
it, it, and actually just kind of being in jerk in general. So interestingly, when surveyed, managers would say, folks, are, our employees are six times more willing to, to give you what you want if they like you. All right, I mean, that's huge, guys. So I don't think anyone on this call today is probably a jerk. I'm gonna say that's a probably pretty, pretty safe guess. But if you are the kind of person who doesn't treat people very respectfully, who's very self-serving, doesn't take one for the team, it's gonna be a pretty hard sell for you to go in and ask for a raise. But I thought that was amazing. When you are a likable person in your workplace, you're seen as a team player, you have good collegiality, you are six times more likely to get what you want, which is awesome, that's amazing. All right, so now I'm gonna give you some quick tips about what happens if they say no, okay? <laughs> which could happen, all right? So here's, here's no. So here's, um, no could be not now, not no altogether, okay? So if, this, if your supervisor says no, then what you could consider is an upgrade in your position. Um, you know, if you were to say, okay, well, is there a chance that I could actually work at this level? Okay, that I would take on these tasks or this higher level work, and then can I in six months, can we put this in writing, then in six months we can come back to the table and we can talk about it if I've been able to perform at these levels and add this added level of value. So that's one thing you could do. Um, and then another thing you do say, well, what would it take for me to get what I'm asking for, all right? So it could be that, hey, you know what, Julie, we just, we gotta get through this fiscal year. January, we might be in a better position to reevaluate that. We'll have a, a good feel after the Christmas holiday season, how our retail is going, and say, great, okay, so what I'm hearing you say is that if I come back to you in the middle of January, we could, we could read this, you know, we could discuss this again, yes. And so then I would make sure in the middle of January, I come back, um, to do this, but just ask us, what would it take? Like, I really feel, not I want, but I really feel like I should be compensated this level. So what do I have to do, or what needs to happen for me to be able to get to, um, to, get to that level? Okay, then uh, again, if they just turn you down flat, um, this is not a good time to do it in an argument or to break down crying. That's not probably the best way to approach it. So if they say, um, you know what, no, Julie, I, I, it's just, I can't do it then some of the things that you should say just right in that moment, just to kind of get you through that piece is, I understand your position uh, and you leave the room. You, you don't get into it, you don't get emotional, you allow yourself just a chance just to regroup uh, for that person to talk about it. And, um, and again, a more ambiguous response is sometimes more effective than an aggressive one because it, it a little bit leaves the boss wondering what the heck you might do next, okay? If you're gonna stay and, and, and leave. Uh, and so those are some thoughts around that. Anyone else have some thoughts around specifically the example of um, asking for a raise? Anything that went especially well or not as well for you? All right, well, I, I love the, the questions, even though I'm an independent contractor, but I still like, I, there's still great questions to ask yourself. You know, so what, so the, like the one you said, what are, um, what am I doing uh, that goes, gosh, I can't remember my writing, but what am I doing that's, that um, is above and beyond for my, for my clients or, you know, mm -hmm. with your employer? Um, you know, how do I make things more efficient? I think all those are great mm -hmm. questions. And then I would, then I go back and I think about, let's say I was working for somebody and I did go and ask for a raise. And I love that question that you said, what would it take for me to get what I'm asking for? Because mm -hmm. that could also potentially lead. And then there's another question I thought of, you know, is there something that I'm not doing? So it's a no. So is there something that I'm not doing that would make a greater contribution to this company's profitability? So I think, you know, so how can I, how, how can I help get this company to the next level where it's gonna, we're all gonna make more money? Um, the other good thing about that is you get real good clarity about where you are at a company because if you get a flat no and they don't have to have a conversation with you and they don't wanna give you any feedback, then you know you just found out that maybe this is not the best place for you. Right. Not that you're going to exactly. walk out right now, but where are you going to go where there's going to be more opportunity where you can rise above where you are? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. And, and ultimately, I mean, leaving is always not, is always your option. But is it, how can you exhaust the other things first? Jan, were you trying to say something? I'm sorry. I was just going to say from an opposite perspective. Um, 
so I was in staffing and recruiting for 30 years. So I had I was a recruiter. So I found candidates, presented them to companies, I did the offers, I was the middleman, whatever. So for those of you who are mid-career or older or more whatever, further along in your career, and so you have somebody that comes to you and asks you for a raise then um, I learned this a long time ago from one of my managers and I thought it was kind of brilliant. So whatever. Um, so I just would say to the person, you know, like somebody's coming in as a senior nuclear engineer and they want to make $200,000 a year and the company's only willing to pay $150,000 a year because they don't need a senior nuclear engineer or whatever. So you just say, empathize with them and say, I understand. I'm not saying that you're not worth the $200,000. The seat is not worth $200,000. Right. So I understand that you, in order to be, you know, be happy making a move, you need to have a salary increase. And this is not, this is not a no to you. And this is not, it has no, it has no reflection on your worth as a person or an employee. It's just that this position does not warrant that kind of a salary. Right. So. Um, it made telling people, I mean, that, that's a, that's a stinky place to be when somebody says, you know, I want whatever. And then you go to the client and the client says, yeah, and that's not. And then you, I mean, I made a, hundreds of those phone calls to say, I'm really sorry, but they're going to stick at 150. And so anyway, just kind of the yeah. opposite side of the coin. Yeah. And, and, and at least, you know, cause then you can decide, I mean, you have to be you have to be honest. And like you said, I mean, you know, an employer, you know, we, we tend to have this mindset that, well, you know, I'm sure they, they can afford more. I mean, there, there, no, there are caps to things. Same as salaries are going to have a cap to it. So that's a really, um, it's a really good point. Anyone else have something along that same area or something around related? Um, I was going to say my, um, my, I work directly for my CEOs in my company and they love stats. So um, when we come in and we say, we give them specific numbers, you know, I was able to say, hey, I contributed 220% more to our commissions. They were like, hell yeah. You know, you have to yeah. give them specific numbers because they have so many people that work for them, they have no idea. So if you give them the specific stats to know how much more money they made, they love that because they don't have a chance to look at all 200 and million employees that work for them. So that's a really good thing. I love that it, that you pointed that out. They want the specific stats. So it's nice for that. And they also, um, talking earlier, I know I have 41 people that work underneath me. So I always, always say in my review, I wouldn't be where I am without the 41 people. So I'm always praising on the people that are underneath me because mm. I can't do my job without them. So that is always a good thing to do in your review as well. Can't do it without a good team. So, right. yeah. I love that. And I, and I think that that's going to be in your, in what you're doing is you're, you're, I'm sure you're doing that because you're just a really good person too. But that also, um, I mean, it really does a lot to, to build trust and credibility. So I'm sure that the people working under you are not going to be, not going to begrudge you for getting a raise if you do, because you, you showcase them. You're an ambassador mm -hmm. for them as well. Mm -hmm. The same thing applies to not only asking for a raise, but in looking for a job. And I still get calls because of what I've done and people will say, Hey, I know that you did this and my son's interviewing. Can you do a mock interview and help him with his resume? Fill him up with facts and figures. Don't, you know, I responsible for, I've done this, tell them that you improved sales 220%. Tell them, I mean, that's what employers love. It's not about what we can do for you. It's what you can do for them. So kill them with data. I mean, that, that's what resume should be, not fluffy, nice words and advertisements. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll make an admission for myself and then I'm going to be quiet because you've been hearing from me way too much. So I know my prior, my job that I had prior, um, you know, I it was a great organization, but I, I went up for, I applied for like four different promotions where I was before. And I, all my colleagues, the people that worked under me or with me, they were my peers. They're like, oh my gosh, Julia, you're a shoe in for this job. I mean, four times I went up to apply for promotion and did not get any of them. And so what I did in that particular case, I had a really good rapport with the VP for HR at that, at that organization. And I, I just set up a meeting with her and I said, 
tell me, can, can you tell me what I'm missing? Is there something about my, my, any behaviors or my work ethic or, you know, anything, you know, how I'm being perceived in this organization that might be preventing me from, you know, from getting, being promoted, just help me out, be, help me be honest with that. In that particular case, she said, it's not, it's, and, and this is not something anyone's going to tell you when you get turned down for a job, right? Because they don't, all the legal ramifications for it. And, and, and in this particular case, it was just, it was just a personality difference. The person who was in the, the role that I would have had, I reported, would have reported to in all four of these instances, just, you know, the, the way, kind of the energy level that I had and sort of more, my personality, it just, it wasn't a good match for her style. And so as long as I was going to be there, I was never going to get promoted because this person valued this kind of personality. And so kind of like what you guys were saying, so it just became evident to me. I was really grateful for that insight because I was going to be okay with, if they were said, listen, you know, Julie, you really, you, you're very off-putting, you know, <laughs> whatever. And I could have learned from that would have been, I mean, I was open to that, but that kind of input made me realize, like you said, okay, I'm just at the end of my road here. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to have opportunities here. And it's just, it's not because I don't work hard or I don't produce so much, uh, much because the way I approach things, the, my man, you know, the, my, I'm kind of a visionary kind of person, which I don't think is a bad thing, but this wasn't valued by this particular person. And so, like you guys said, it was just, it, it gave me an excuse to look for something else. And I'm truly glad I did because I love what I do. Any, and how about the rest of you? Because we're, we're about out of, we're pretty much out of time, but what other ways have you found using your influence in a, in, in a very effective way? And maybe it's not even just within a business context. Maybe you've had to use negotiating I mean, skills in a more. more of a difficult interpersonal situation without getting too personal, I guess. Any other tips for each other? So I'll share a little bit. Um, I work for Greens and House School District. I have to be best friends with every single front office lady that is in <laughs> any of our buildings. So anytime I have a phone call and I'm asking for even a small bit of information or a big favor, I always tell them, you know, like, how are you? Oh, that's great. You know, I spend that extra minute or two chit chatting because then they're that much more willing to help me because, you know, we're friends. Even if they may not know my face, they only know my voice and they only know my name. So for me, that's made a huge difference and an impact on me being able to get the information that I need at a faster pace and just having that contact person in the building, even if they have to pass me along to somebody else. Yep, never underestimate your front desk people. Oh for yeah. Sure. Front desk people and the custodians never make friends with, I mean, you should anyway, it's just the right thing to do. Anything else? What other ideas do you guys have? So for me, I, cause I deal with, you know, all different types of people. And so sometimes, and, and it can be very emotional um, for, well, it is emotional for folks when they're buying and selling a home. Um, so if they're texting or they're calling me about whatever, I always agree with them and then guide them where they actually need to be. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. So like I have a, a one client right now, she tends to kind of go to the negative. So I always agree with her point of view. And then I guide her into a more positive frame of mind because, and not because I'm trying to manipulate her, but I'm trying to just help her actually see the other side of the, the coin and the, and the actual full picture and the truth of the matter, because that's in her best interest. It's not in her interest to be negative. It's in her interest to see the full picture. And so that's, yeah, but I start with a grade and then guide them yeah. to where I know is best for them to be. Well, it sounds like what you're, you're giving her control. People, people mm -hmm. want to have control over their own circumstances. And so by doing that, you're give, you're empowering her that for that, which is awesome. Another Stephen Covey thing, seek first yeah. to understand and then to be understood. Right. Right. And I, you know, I find, you know, I don't know about you all, but I have found my best management lessons have been from being a parent. <laughs> right. I mean, and I, and I don't know that all of us are parents necessarily, but you know, getting, you know, figuring out what matters to my kids and, you know, um, giving them, you know, we talk about, you know, we talk about good parenting is getting kids to feel like they have some control over a decision. I mean, those things don't go away. We still have those needs as we grow up as well, for sure. 
Billy, one of the things I do, and it's not just when my crew asks for raises or anything else, but like when we do the reviews and stuff, I have them fill out a review on themselves awesome. before I go show them the one that I have filled out just to see where they think they are and to see how they compare. Do they like that approach, Mindy? Yeah. Actually, it, it does work because I mean, most of the times they're harder on themselves than, oh. uh, than I am. That's really, we, really cool. We also okay. have one, they fill one out on me as a supervisor so that we know how to manage each other. I love that. This has been a good one. Um, I know a couple ladies on this call know this, but um, when I, People tend to, they at work, and I know some of you ladies will think that they call me the bad cop, <laughs> <laughs> which is hard to believe because everybody's like, but you're so nice, which is the point because um, there's a little cult group that I'm in, Little Black Book for Women, and I'm the event director. So, <laughs> hey, we are a cult, but we're a good cult. <laughs> Everyone wants to be our friend, okay? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to have connections everywhere. So I like to be, everyone has to be my best friend. So like she was saying, every, she has to talk to everyone. Hi, how are you? Want to be my friend? Like I want to hug everyone, but I can't because of COVID. So I feel like everyone I have to talk to, I have to get to know them. Like, who's your mom? What's your brother? How's your grandma? Like I have to get to know every single person in the universe. So everyone's my best friend in the entire St. Charles County. I don't care who they are, but if I can still be mean to them, but when I left, they didn't even know I yelled at them. Like that's like the art of influence. Like if I just screamed at one of my employees, they left and they go, man, I, she's having a great day, isn't she? But I just reamed them and they had no idea. Like that is my art. <laughs> Apparently so. You have, you obviously have credibility. You have, they've yeah. developed trust with you for sure. Yeah. The one thing you guys were, um, I know you talked about, Mindy mentioned it to you about having, um, them do their own evaluation. And I'm sure many of you guys do not do this, but I, I've worked for organizations where I've done that and then my employer doesn't do anything. So that like, we need to be really careful about that. So, you know, I've gone into evaluations where I've done all this thoughtful insight and I've been hard on myself where I, you know, in different areas. And then my, you know, employer's like, oh, wait, yeah, what, what was that stuff you gave me here? Oh yeah, so let's look through it. Like, the, 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 your, your supervisor, if you're going to do that from employees, and that's very stressful in some instances, then I think you need to have enough respect for the individual to equally, also equally invest as much time in preparing your feed for, feedback for them as well. Don't you agree with that? Oh, I definitely do. And usually it's followed up with a raise. There you go. So, I mean, that's... <laughs> That's awesome. I did a, um, it's midterms right now at Lindenwood. Um, and so I, this is shocking to the students. I, I send them out a, a, a survey monkey midterm evaluation of me. Like, cause I, I don't want to hear at the end of the semester, like that my stories were getting old or that I did whatever to, I don't know. I don't want to wait. Like I'm all about formative evaluation. So give me, and it's, and it's going to be, I'm going to ask them questions about stuff that I actually have some control over. You know, I'm not going to ask them about technology because I don't have a lot of control <laughs> over that right now. But I'll say, you know, do, you know, am I teaching in an engaging style? Am I, am I consistent with the syllabus? And because th then I can actually do something about it still in the next eight weeks. Um, but again, never ask for, never ask for an evaluation if you don't have any intention of actually using the feedback. That's for sure. All right. Any other questions or, or any questions for the, the group or Comments for the good of the order? This was excellent. Well, you guys are excellent. Let me see if there's anything in the chats that I should have been paying attention to. Yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. The thing behind the thing. I love that. I, I don't remember, is that, I don't remember who coined that, but I, I love it. And I, you know, I, you guys might do this too. Like I think about that when I go to the pharmacy, when I talk to a cashier, you guys are probably like this too. I am hardcore about not being on the phone when I'm, when I'm buying stuff. I want to engage with that cashier. They may not want to talk to me for very long and that's fine. 
um, but having enough respect and you know knowing that you know maybe the reason that people are being crabby is just all this other stuff that's been happening um, today. Yeah, I'm good. Calling that environmental fatigue. That's my. Yes. Opinion. Everybody has a really short. Not everybody. Some people like Mark Harlander just roll with the flow and are always gentle and kind. I know we all wish we could be like Mark. Yeah. So there are other people that, whatever, they just lose their cool and. I've had all my kids in the last week or two call me in tears because somebody did something or, you know, whatever. It's just like, we've all got short fuses right now. It's the pandemic. It's not having our regular lives. It's not being able to go out with friends. It's not being able to, to go out to eat. It's not being able to all of those things that we can't do. And then the, and the, the election and just everything right. is just feels like it's, we're just in a stew being just stirred around. So that's my term I coined environmental fatigue. I love it. I love it. Jan, whenever, forever and ever when I see you, I'll be thinking of that term first. <laughs> that and your fall, your fall decorations. <laughs> All right. Well, I am so grateful that you guys, um, that you made time for this. You guys rock. You, in fact, will be the, uh, the best class ever. Well, we know that. <laughs> yeah. We are the longest, longest. class ever. You are the <laughs> longest class ever. <laughs> Oh, we're going to be I, the best longest class. Yes. I love vision, but I, I do not like that tagline. Whenever, whenever we say that, I'm just going to put that right out there. Right. We're all longest the best class. ever. But we will be the only longest class ever. <laughs> oh, I hope. <laughs> oh, no. So, we're the smartest too. Just saying. I'm uh, sure you are. <laughs> <laughs> the smartest, the uh, bestest. Julie, Julie, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, always your expertise and uh, your availability to be able to help us in a lot of situations. Genuinely help and, and uh, means an awful lot. Thank you so much for, for presenting today. Right. Well, it was a privilege. You guys all have a great rest of your week. Thanks, Julie. Well, thank you, guys. I think. Keep your eyes uh, open. We'll be getting the information out and uh, for our next one coming up in November. So make sure you keep your, uh, your uh, eyes on your email boxes. We'll keep that stuff coming to you real quick. Be sure and stay in touch with me. If you all need anything, don't hesitate to reach out. I also sent an email out um, about 10 days ago, something like that, maybe two weeks ago, encouraging you guys to connect. I know that this isn't the best, but make sure that you're reaching out to other class members, maybe somebody that you don't know at all. Um, grab a virtual coffee, a virtual happy hour, whatever it might be. Go sit down six feet away from study in a park, sit and chat with your class members, whatever it might be. Again, I just want to make sure that we're doing that now before, uh, before we all start getting together uh, for regular programming dates coming up next year. I want to make sure we know each other really well. So make sure you're taking advantage of that. All right. Great. Thank you guys for all you do. Appreciate it very much. Thank you.